Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Rush Deep Dive. Today, we are talking about 1980s permanent waves. Fantastic record with fantastic cover art. Uh, as always, I'm going to read from Hugh Symes' Art of Rush about the permanent waves cover art. Here we go. <clears throat> the album title seemed inherently rich in visual possibilities. We thought Permanent waves refers to so many things like trends and the way news will travel, says Hugh. People can wrongly assume the outcome of certain events in history, like Dewey defeats Truman. Hugh is referring to the infamous Chicago Tribune front page headline from November 3rd, 1948. When the newspaper went to press early, its editors assumed that the Republican candidate had prevailed over the incumbent uh, in the presidential election. Neil and Hugh decided to incorporate the infamous headline into the album's artwork. As the drummer and art director discussed the album title, their conceptual ideas became increasingly fanciful and playful. Hugh dreamed up an elaborate visual pun that included a woman from the 1950s strolling away from a tidal wave. I suggested a woman who looked like actress Donna Reed with a Tony home permanent hairstyle from that era, which is now which is how women and teens would do their own hair and perming if they did their hair at home, recalls Hugh. As an artist, I was really challenged. How would I do this? Step one, find a photo taken during a hurricane. Hugh's research led him to Flip Schulke, a Life magazine photojournalist. Schulke was renowned for his shots of natural disasters, including the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Carla in Galveston, Texas on September 11th, 1961. He was captivated by one particular image in which a sh in which a shoulder of water barges through Murdoch's bathhouse on Galveston's oceanfront. In early September 1979, Hugh tracked down Shulky in the phone book and called his home in Mobile, Alabama, to request permission to use the photograph. Shulky hadn't heard of Rush, but he granted the band permission to use his photograph. Now that Hugh had his his photographic template. He had to work quickly to meet the deadline of the album's January release date. The next step, find someone who can embody Hugh's vision of Donna Reed with cascading hair. Enter Paula Turnbull, an emerging young model represented by the rather appropriately named Ooh La La Agency. Hugh recruited Deborah Samuel, who developed a portfolio of music and fashion photography to handle Turnbull's makeup and styling. British music photographer Finn Costello who'd previously photographed Rush in concert, arrived to shoot Turnbull inside Samuel's studio in Toronto. It was a breezy shoot, literally. A large fan made, made Turnbull's uh, crimp circle skirt appear less, even less modest than that worn by Marilyn Monroe in the seven-year itch. Composing the final image was a bit like cutting and assembling a jigsaw puzzle. The final piece of the jigsaw was Hugh, whom Costello had photographed so that he'd appear on the album cover in his very own cameo. That's Hugh Syme cheerily waving, oblivious to the oblivion behind him. Alas, the job wasn't done just yet. At the last minute, the Chicago Tribune denied Rush's permission to reproduce its embarrassing newspaper headline. Uh, let's see. Shame and censorship from the Tribune three decades later comments you another legal snag was the billboard signs for coca-cola and pearl beer in the background of shulky's original photograph those would have to go too as a compromise solution hugh layered a white strip over the newspaper headline hugh's other makeshift change was inspired he tweaked the sign for pearl to read peart instead then he covered the coca-cola sign with a lifeson logo and added lee's name and lights too the final permanent waves image is a classic it elegantly balances the busyness of its individual elements with wide open spaces and dramatic lighting. In Turnbull, the composition boasts a strong focal point. The striking image successfully heralded a shift in the band's sound, and it showcased another facet of Rush's band identity that hadn't been readily apparent in its visual presentation. That is fun. So what do we think of this? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a monochromatic, I guess, right? I mean, it's kind of only a couple colors used, but I think it it really, um, you know, well, actually this, so my album cover, I don't know, 
Tim how yours is, but mine does say Dewey defeats Truman. So uh, my, th this is a Canadian sleeve because we don't care, eh? Um, and it has <laughs> this is like this is one from 1980, and it's got the headline. And I've also got a U.S. Uh, Mercury pressing where that doesn't have it. Okay, yeah. And then we should also mention uh, the 40th anniversary edition with um, Hugh found this uh, guy that ver looks very much like present day David Lee Roth to me. <laughs> and uh, the headline says, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, one other thing I, that I was reading um, about the artwork was that this part, this area and, and, and you know, basically everything behind Paul Turnbull um, was very blurry this photograph was actually you know kind of um i don't know maybe pixelated is the wrong word but uh they basically had to do that to the image of paul turnbull in order to put it on the graphic to make it mesh make properly yeah. yeah uh which is kind of an interesting i got a couple of things to say about this cover i'll tell you one person who probably got a big kick out of it was getty's mom and I'll tell you why. Coming from that era, the idea of getting a home permanent was a big deal. There was this company called Lilt here in the States, and they probably had versions of that company in Canada and Breck and various others where you could get a home permit. It never looked professional. I'm sorry. But for people that couldn't afford to go to a salon, this was a very big deal for women of a certain age. And I know an awful lot of women that bought those home permanents and they, you know, did the whole thing with the rollers and this and that. And it's a great pun okay and this begins a series of puns we talked last time about moving pictures you know where you have people like taking the okay boys let's take some pictures and they take the pictures and here we have permanent waves okay and what you were trying for when you got a home permanent was that wave that little curl like the marilyn monroe kind of curl thing so there's an entire layer, no pun intended, of puns, pun intended, with the title Permanent Waves. And I will bet you everyone who grew up in the 40s or the 50s, if it was, if you were female yourself, if you had a sister or a mother, you remember this. I can remember my mother would get a Tony. They'd have those commercials. If you really want a perm, get a Tony. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they had this little snappy little tune and and whatever it was the chemicals that were inside oh i i'd complain i did mom what are you doing they would stink up the whole house they'd all be all she'd have her hair up in curlers with the hair you know yeah <laughs> i remember that very well also yep. there's um if you look close under where it says rush it says permanent ways but it's like uh oh raid not radar but it's like an ekg like wavelengths yeah yeah which is <clears throat> was a working title for this album. They were going to call it Wavelength and they were going to have like EKG readings um, of each of the band members, I guess. And they decided they were going to scan else. their brains, I believe, and get the yeah. the readings of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I've also there's... read that they didn't end up using it. And it just so happens that what Hugh had had in mind is very much similar to what the police ended up doing for the Synchronicity album cover. Yes, I've heard that too. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention um, is now we're going to talk about this tonight. Matt specifically is going to talk about natural science, but the third section of natural science is called permanent waves. And in this book, the song by song book that we sometimes reference on, or will always reference on Rush Roundtable, um, it says the permanent waves that are alluded to in this part of the song and the album's title represent the cycl cyclical nature of all things. As the tide pulls in, it will destroy all the previous tide pools. And yet as it recedes, more will be created in their place, leaving life to go on as it was. thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Little take there at the end of it, but anything, Matt, you want to add anything? This is your favorite record, right? Well, yeah, it is actually it happens to be, I think, you know, not that you can actually pick one, but if yeah. you were forcing me onto a desert Island and I could only bring one rush record, chances are this is the one I'm going to take. 
Um, it's interesting though. I being a child of the two thousands, I have never heard of a. Well, I've seen the old ladies with their hair and curlers, but I had no idea that that was such a deep reference by them. I always thought of it as you know when you shoot radio waves out into space. You know, you can still hear like radio broadcasts from the 20s and 30s if you go far enough out into space and it sort of never ends. You know, it's sort of a permanent wave. That's always what I thought permanent waves was supposed to mean. But to each his own. I mean, that's part of what makes them so cool is that there's always a hidden joke or a hidden, sure. you know, thing. Nothing's ever as it seems completely. Cool. All right, well, let's talk about uh, four of the six fantastic songs on this record. We're going to start with uh, side B, right? Yeah, side two. Yeah. Entree New. Donna, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, I think this song is completely underrated, all right? Not just because it's one of my favorites, but every time I suggest to someone that they listen to it, they're like, you know, it's it was never even like played in a Rush concert for years. I don't think that it was played until like, what, 2007 or something like that. I mean, and I'm sitting there like, why won't they play this song? This is just a great song. I love the guitar work. I, the lyrics are incredibly simple and yet profound. I, I don't know. I just, when people say to me, oh, Rush can't do a love song. I'm like, really? Have you listened to Entre Nous? Okay. I mean, beyond the garden, beyond some of the other stuff they've done. I just think this is a really beautiful song. I really do. Um, so a couple of things I want to say about it. Um, the title, of course, is French for Between Us. And online, there are a few people who have surmised that Neil got it from Ayn Rand's novel, The Fountainhead, where it's said by a bunch of characters. I'm going to go there in a second and say that I don't think so, okay? But let's talk about how it's used. The words entre nous, which of course are French for between us, the way it's used in the Fountainhead is the way I remember it being used when I was growing up. It was kind of like a way of just kind of like, Shh, can I tell you a secret? Just, just kind of between us, you know? Little confidential knowledge here. And of course it wasn't really confidential. It was sort of like two people just sharing a reaction to something. Okay, that is how it was used, and that is how it's used in the Fountainhead. And that's not surprising because Ayn Rand lived in that era when the expression was very common. I remember hearing my parents say it, etc. Donna, what's your point? In most of Ayn Rand's books and short stories, it's always about the individual over everything. But that's not what this song is about. This song isn't about the individual Uber Alice. This song is about getting closer to someone even when you almost kind of don't want to. Um, you're talking about like we're planets drifting in our own orbits. We're talking about we're islands. We're trying to build bridges, but in reality, we're, we're secrets to each other. Each one's life, a novel no one else has read. We're unique, but we're trying to find that connection. We're trying desperately to find someone who understands. Neil looked at music like that. Neil looked at music as a way to communicate, a way to reach out to an audience, a way to reach out to people. And in the song, we're planets to each other, to a brief eclipse, each of us a world apart, alone and yet together, like two passing ships. And notice the repetition. We've talked before, when Neil repeats something, it is never accidental. He does it for a reason. And the chorus here, 
just between us, I think it's time for us to recognize the difference we sometimes feared to show. I think for Neil, around that time in his life, he's got a wife. There's question about whether they were ever legally married, but they were certainly common law. They were together for years. And they now they have a kid. And Neil is finding, Neil is finding that there's so much more than just himself. There's so much more than just me and my drums against the world. And now he has to let someone else in. He has to let this little human in. He has to let his wife in. And of course, he has his relationship with the band. And when I think about all of this, I think about that song by Kiss, which I always hated. I never liked the song, a song called Beth. But it's a song. Uh, no, the reason I hated it is I just, ew. Um, I don't like the way the song says, well, my music comes first. And Beth, you know, too bad you're sad, but my music comes first. So get over it. But that's not how Neil feels. Neil has the Beth dilemma. He has a wife. He has a kid. He has his music. He has his band. He has his drums. And he's trying to get them to all fit in. He's trying to let people get close to him. And yet he still feels by nature the need to just be distant sometimes. That's a real dilemma for the artist, for the musician. And he really feels it. He says, I think it's time for us to realize the space in between. Leave room for you and I to grow. He wants that closeness. He wants that relationship. He doesn't want to just be that individual. Hey, Beth, just live with it. You know, there's my music. And it's not how he's feeling at all. This song is about trying to find balance. The song is about trying to accept that love is in your life and you have to make room for it, but that there's also times when you have to pull back. And entre nous, just between the two of us, there's a special way that we communicate. And I want to widen that to the wider world and communicate with them too. And I'm trying to make it work. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. I have a whole bunch of comments to add. Um, <laughs> and not a whole bunch, a couple. Nothing though. bad, I hope. No. Um, the kiss reference so funny enough um beth was written by their drummer peter chris right yeah. so there's a little bit of parallel there although um it, i'm gonna make a reference to kiss later on in this episode too funny enough so um uh, it's not a positive reference even though i like kiss it's not a positive reference what i but, like about kiss is how good they were to rush in the early days of yeah their career. and sure. i can speak to that firsthand because i was backstage with them i got to actually see them without their makeup and i got to see them just mentoring rush and yeah. i really appreciated that i really did because they were i may not have been that fond of their music although there's a couple of songs of theirs that i really love but you know i was made for love and you classic record should have been a <laughs> um but i digress um i was backstage just watching them they were like these famous guys rush were up and coming and they could not have been nicer to Rush at a time when a lot of other groups talking to you, ZZ Top, could not have been more contemptuous, okay? And I will never forget that. And that is another story for another day. I always heard Aerosmith wasn't very good to them either. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I have a, I'm not going to share, and I have a story about that too. But um, yeah, Kiss another one of the most hard hardest working bands ever too, despite what you think of their music. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say was that I kind of thought of Donna, as you were talking, it was, uh, I think it was the color of right on test for echo that I talked about. I think I talked about that song, how I kind of thought that was written about road life in a way. Um, and their relationships with their significant others while on the road. And I kind of just 
thought of that with this song, like we are planets to each other, you know, drifting in our orbits to a brief eclipse, each of us a world apart alone, but yet together like two passing ships. So it's almost like their relationships being on the road, being so distant, being so far apart, quite literally geographically, but still having that connection. Like, and you know what the most important word in the whole song is? And it's a word you don't see that much from Neil, but you're seeing it now. The word hopeful, okay? We are islands to each other building hopeful bridges. He wants to have hope. He's in love. Sure. He has a kid. He has a family. He loves his parents. I mean, that side of him is not well known to a lot of people. When people think Neil, they think driven, you know, just like the drums are everything. And in his own little quiet way, he's saying, it's really human to want to hope. It's really human to want to think like, gee, maybe I don't have to be an island. Maybe it's okay to build a bridge. Maybe the novel of our life, maybe not everybody's going to read that novel but we can still share moments with each other and still be hopeful. Yep. That's why I love this song. Oh yeah. And can we also just talk about Alex's playing on this song too? It's oh God, yes. Absolutely. Is- oh, oh. I don't oh. think, I don't think he carries a Rush song single-handedly as much ever as this one. I mean, his guitar just sweeps through the whole thing. I said, I love the guitar work on this song. I don't know what to say about it in terms of genre. It's not really like a power ballad. It's that arpeggiated, yet, you know, riff in the beginning. It's yes. the 12 string yeah. in the chorus. It's it's fantastic. It's pure album. It just, he doesn't even need to do a solo together. in it. Yes. It and there's no like solos. That, we're that, all just, we're a that, team here. That little, um, that little interlude in the middle, again, the arpeggiated thing, which he does so well. And you don't even notice that there's no solo because by the time the chorus comes back in, it feels like you've taken that little break instrumentally mm-hmm. i mean it's al what do you expect well, the, the uh alex body in this book uh stated probably the poppiest rush song or probably the most excuse me probably the poppiest song rush had recorded to date um doesn't feature a guitar solo but it is a testament to rush's continuing maturation as songwriters and i think yeah i think this record you know at the turn of the decade signals a uh um transition in it's it's a transitional album it literally is the perfect transition from hemispheres to moving pictures it's it's the perfect album i I admit this is one of and i don't normally have favorite rush albums but this is one of my favorite rush albums i really just it's a classic there's not a bad song on it i'm sorry no it's a classic (laughs) yeah i mean the next i want to talk about is probably the least known it's the only one not played live uh different strings tim go ahead and and i have a real soft spot for this album too because it was my first rush album it's the first when i started getting into rush in like 87 it's the first rush tape i ever had i don't have the exact tape anymore and the funny thing is is that that tape actually had a copyright date on it of 1979 i know it was early 1980 but when i started reading that it came out in 1980 I'm like no it didn't but also, I, I, I do want to mention the cover of the booklet of the 40th anniversary of Permanent Waves does have the Dewey Defeats Truman um, headline. But different strings. Um, beautiful little song. I say little song. It's relatively short compared to um, definitely what comes after it. Lyrics, once again, and, and I think for the last time, simply by Getty. And so Getty wrote um, Tears, and he wrote... Uh, I believe Cinderella Man. Cinderella Man. And when when Getty had a turn at writing lyrics, you know, if you didn't know, and it just had a general credit, you know, music by Lee Lifeson, lyrics by Peart, I wouldn't have thought anything different. There's nothing that different but by, from the lyrics here. So it kind of tells me that Getty and Neil kind of thought the same. Um, or he learned from him over the years, too. I mean. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, when you consider that, you know, and I love the first album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you go from In the Mood and, like, Making Memories and Best I Can to, to Cinderella Man and, and this, yeah. Um, you know, he turned into a, a perfectly fine lyricist. Uh, great imagery. Um, 
you know, who's come to slay the dragon. So li- not, a, not a literal dragon making arrows out of pointed words. Um, it feels like um, a, a sequel to Entre New, which in and of itself, again, Neil revisiting themes. If you, you know, we are planets to each other, makes me think we are strangers by one chromosome which he would, you know, many, many years later on Alien Shore. Alien Shore. But yeah. Um, all there really is, the two of us, we both know why we've come along. I mean, just between us. It, it seems like he's continuing this dialogue. Um, musically, it's it's really, really gorgeous. Um, I love, you know, Hugh Sign plays piano on this. It's just, it's, it's just a really nice part. Alex's guitar parts in this range from, um, like, really beautiful acoustic, I'm guessing, 12-string parts, to a really kind of um, a really unique guitar solo, which unfortunately fades out just as the song is starting to pick up. Um, but I don't mind because it's a little bit this this song on this album kind of serves the same purpose that Madrigal served on a Farewell to Kings. Because listen, we've got this huge epic song coming up. We're going to take a breather now. Yeah. So if you'll indulge us here. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, different, I've, different hearts. You know, this is another, this could be another misheard lyric, uh, Ryan, because I always thought it was different hearts feed on different strings, but it's beat on different strings, which of course makes more sense. Um, and I've seen this quote has been used so many times to be found within a song. Um, that's you know that's just that's perfect uh it, it could speak to the fan base um i like how the in the visual here they've got like all these hands doing like what do they call it a cat's cradle with the uh, with the yarn something um, like that yeah kind of a literal <laughs> definition of, of different strings but um i've just always really liked the song it provides a nice little breather on the album and um uh, you know it would have been perfect you know when they did their uh on R30 when they would do their little acoustic, when they did Resist and Heart Full of Soul, this is a song if they ever did, had done an Unplugged. I know they didn't want to do an Unplugged because everybody did an Unplugged, but this would have lent itself to that format perfectly. And they really wouldn't have had to do that much to the arrangement. I, there's really not much more I can say about it. It's a great song. And yeah, Permanent Waves is probably in my top five Rush albums. I have a couple quotes to add. Um... So, uh, Different Strings was designed as a purely studio creation to test the band's most ornate musical instincts. Hugh Syme, who directs the band's uh, album, or or creates the band's album covers, made another guest appearance playing the grand piano on this song. Um, And then this one's from Alex in regards to the, uh, actually that first quote was from uh, Bill Banaswitz, Rush Visions. Uh, The next one, I think it's how you say his last name. Next one's from Alex in Merely Players. Uh, I love the feel, the tune. It reminds me of soldiers sitting around a piano in a smoke-filled pub in England during the war. It's the type of solo I really enjoy playing, an emotive bluesy sort of thing. It's kind of the odd man out on this record, but yeah, it's it's definitely the slowdown song, and it, it, there's so many parallels B-side wise to that of um Throw the Kings. Yeah. Like you mentioned. I mean, you got, I think it, it's, no, I think it's Cinderella Man, right? right. And then and Madrigal then and then Madrigal Cygnus. and then Cygnus. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a breather. Yeah. It's totally it's a, a breather. One. It's totally a breather before an epic, quite frankly. So fantastic little, uh, I use the term little too, because I think it's the shortest song on the record, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's a great piece, and it's one that you know if you're not familiar with, you know they never did it live. It's one of uh, if you're not familiar with it, definitely go back, have a listen because it's a great vocal too from Ged. It is for sure. All right, we good, Matt. Uh, wheels okay. within wheels in a spiral array. Go oh, ahead, yeah. natural science. Yes. So before I dive into natural science, just finishing up the farewell to Kings side tangent. I'm wearing my Primus shirt. Please go see Primus. Do this record if you can. It's fantastic. What a great show. Okay. Um, And tune in for the Farewell to Kings deep dive later on. Okay. Uh, So Natural Science 
uh, to me, has always been a quintessential tune. I mean, and I know Getty certainly feels that way. I, I know that he was the biggest champion of them bringing it back in the 2000s, back into the touring rotation where it belongs, even without the second guitar solo. I mean, what can you say? I got to see it in 2007, one guitar solo, but I was pretty happy. Um, so there's three parts to it, obviously, that we all know. Um, but I think it's it's actually strange to me. The, the sections of this song, I don't think, get enough attention because they are so different. You know, it opens the tide pool section that opens the song is this spacey sort of half acoustic. Um, very wide open um, set of lyrics and, and the way that Getty delivers the vocal with these effects layering all over it, these echoing effects, it almost gives you the feeling you're in some like primordial cavern where there's, you know, not much going on. It's dark. Maybe there's fog. You know, it's it's a very unknown certain direction and the song takes a little while to get going but that's what's so great about them is because it reminds me a lot of xanadu even though it builds up very slow the intro to natural science it's always giving you something to listen to you know those those open chords by alex are fantastic in the beginning and then you know the the lyrics by neil are just neil at his absolute smartest and his the way he crafts these words together i mean i just don't know how he did it um i'm not gonna go through every lyric in the song it would be a bit much but there are lots of cool ones i mean my favorite one is um in this first section anyway is um when they say a uh, simple kind of mirror to reflect upon our own all the busy little creatures chasing out their destinies it sort of gives a bit of perspective to this primordial world that these are in fact living beings at one time we don't know right and then all of a sudden they they forget about the sea right that last acoustic chord goes out and then alex comes in with some more beautiful arpeggios and the electric uh full band comes in and then into this weird i know donna you might have more insight onto how they actually got this sound back in 1980 but the wah 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 that kind of transitions into the hyperspace section with that of course the iconic riff i think it's the best riff um dime for dime on the whole record um all three of them are just it's so tight they're all on the same beat they, they, they don't miss a single second of this and getty's vocal effects keep going in the second section they get even crazier as he's talking about you know a mechanized world out of hand his voice is almost computerized and it seems to sort of disintegrate into this computerized mumbo jumbo and it's sort of like whoa we you know a quantum leap forward in time and space is not an exaggeration we've really gone forward in time here and we've seen wow things have gone wrong, right, in this universe that we had just entered into in a very early stage. Now we go back into the future and it's like, wow, things are not going so well. You know, it's, and no wonder they don't understand. Is, you know, it's so perfect because it speaks to Neil's personal philosophy, what I imagine his personal philosophy would be, um, especially in the third section. Um, this. In my, I think is some of Neil's best lyric writing. Um, and Donna mentioned this earlier. What does he repeat here? The state of integrity, right? That's always gotten me. What is the state of integrity? In my opinion, the state of integrity is the set of requirements that you need to avoid the bad future that we saw in part two, right? Is that this perfect sort of balance between science and nature and valuing both, right? With a view towards its preservation. So you're taming things, you're, you're restricting them, but only in a way that preserves the usefulness of science, scientific research, of preserving nature. Obviously, the importance is clear, but I think it's also um, important to point out that it's all going towards this hopeful message, right? That seems to sort of come through the record. And this song ends on a very hopeful note. You know, the most endangered species, the honest man will still survive annihilation. It's not even a question of if. Neil is predicting that we will, right? As long as you're honest, you will make it through because that is what forms the state of integrity, right? Just being honest, being kind, being open, sharing in this experience that we all have for one reason or another and not focusing too much on everything else. So 
And then, of course, it ends with this. I don't know, again, that much about time signatures. It sounds to me like it's in a different time signature where he says wave after wave will flow with the tide and bury the world as it does. It's sort of this barching onward thing. And I think that's kind of intentional because that's pretty much the way the song ends up, which is that, you know, nature has a wonderful way of erasing one thing and then something else pops up the next day and then it's all you get your there. waves there you get your exactly waves. there's the wave, wave after and, wave and you have the Turn literal waves of the turning. ocean the literal waves of the ocean and though each wave itself will disappear there's always another one coming down the bend which is i mean as always with these guys it gives you so much to think about the lyrics and I mean, the playing as well. I mean, every single section of this. Alex's two solos are amazing. He doesn't stray too far. It feels like an epic, but it also doesn't feel like an almost 10 minute long song. I mean, I listened to it like two or three times today. I was like, that's it. Like, it's it's so fast so you know, to me. It's because it's so well constructed. It doesn't feel like you're sitting there for 10 minutes. It pulls you in. And that's why I love it. And that's why I love the record. So... By the way, I'm glad you mentioned about the the waves and the epics and all. This is a period of time, and he keeps dropping little hints, and some people didn't get it at the time. Neil went through his, as I said earlier, his Ayn Rand period, but now he's a family man. And that's a side of him he doesn't talk about much, but it's very real for him. And he's struggling with how he's supposed to show up in the world. And we're seeing little elements in songs where he is, as I said before, kind of hopeful or trying to be hopeful or thinking about like, what is there that will survive even after all the chaos and all the problems and all the everything else, what will survive? Ethics, hope, integrity, honesty. You know, we're going to talk about spirit of radio. Um, Radio, you know, one likes to believe in the freedom of music. He's watching the whole music industry change, said Donna, who was watching it too, because I was living it. And yeah, I mean, these are things he's observing and they're showing up in his songs. And at the time, We don't get it because we haven't been far enough away from it to kind of look back and go, ah, that's what he was talking about. But I think a lot of us can kind of see it now. So thank you for mentioning that. I got another Uh, uh, lyric that I misheard in there too for years, that the uh, art as expression, (laughs) not as market campaigns. That's the real lyric. I always thought it was not as market can tame. (laughs) It also kind of makes sense. And it's got... I love that it's got one of my favorite drum fills from Neil. And oh, it's so memorable fills. because I could sing it. It's a... <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. I love that. I stop on a dime and then the right back into it. Oh. And then it goes right into Alex's solo after that. Oh, the crate, like the crate, like yeah. tapping and oh. the harmonics and oh. I was listening to that and I remember like thinking, listening to it on Walking the Dog this afternoon. I was like, oh my God, he is flying. <laughs> but it's not but it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like too much i don't know sometimes i listen to van halen and other players and you're just like okay he's just trying to beat the world record for notes per second but i don't think alex ever really tried to do that i think the song deserved an intense solo with lots of notes in it you know it was building up so it was great i don't think he quite gets to the speed he gets in free will because there's a, that's a pretty ripping solo but yeah there there are some pretty fast fast there's some fast picking some fancy picking in that <laughs> Uh, three things before we move on. First, tide pools, the first section. What, what, what is a tide pool, right? It's, as um, reference in this book, I, I, I like some of the stuff this guy wrote in this book about this record. The creatures in tide pools know nothing of their nearby neighbors, finding it impossible to imagine anything more than living in their pools, forgetting about the sea. What uh, Neil was quoted in Ghost Rider, the proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. So tide pools is complete opposite. He's like basically saying, don't be someone who just lives in your house or don't be someone that just lives in your area. 
explore, right? It's kind of saying that um, to many years later, right? But uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was the water at the beginning of the song, right? You know, in the tide pools part is actually Alex and Neil. It was actually Alex and Neil just playing around with oars swirling water around with microphones around the lake at Le Studio at, in Quebec back in, well, probably 79, end of 79. Uh, I do remember there's a story of them just freezing their asses off, just sitting there with just getting drunker and drunker um, to keep warm. And they're just swirling water around. But the last thing I wanted to mention before we move on is this song was the last song that was written for the record. It originally wasn't going to happen. Um, and this is a very, well, probably the Harker fans know this, but it's, I would say it's probably a lesser known fact that this was originally going to be called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, um, that there's a whole bunch of lyrics for, you know, I, I, I believe they, Neil had all the lyrics, Getty and Alex couldn't get the music right. I think the story goes and it never materialized and probably for the better because I almost feel like that would be a step backwards. That would almost, they went in that direction. You're going kind of going back to the, you know, I don't know, historical slash maybe sci-fi stuff, you know, 2112 for all the Kings type material instead of moving forward with, I mean, natural science while it's an epic and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight was going to be this song's long epic to Matt's point, natural science doesn't, necessarily feel like an epic when i listen to natural science which is only a minute or two shorter than xanadu i feel like i'm listening to a radio hit in natural science and i go listen to xanadu and i feel like i'm listening to 2112 it just feels much longer to me um but anyways i digress uh anything else you guys want to say about natural science before we move on all right the spirit of radio. So this is, in my opinion, the ultimate rush opener. It, I mean, it kicks off this album, obviously. Um, oh, one other thing I want to mention, this is rush deep dive, right? I could have talked about Jacob's ladder. It's definitely a deeper cut than the spirit of radio or free will, but I felt we couldn't have, we couldn't talk about permanent waves without talking about either spirit of radio or free will and i took this song i happen to just like it more plus uh fantoons put out a video a year or two ago that features your very favorite deep dive panelist donna halper in it as well so uh <laughs> shout out fantoons um so the song opens uh with iconic alex lives and riff right um you know, it really hooks you the moment you turn on the record. It, to me, it sounds like hammer-ons, but I believe, it, I believe it's just him like strumming and, and picking really fast, right? It's so actually, uh, I'll, I've never been able to play it at full speed. Um, <laughs> I do know the notes. It's actually hammer-on pull-offs, but like, okay, one, two, three, 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 one,
at in 1970 and released in 1980. Um, so it's literally the turn of the decade record. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think overall this song, you know, it's about the freedom of expression in music, like as what's said in natural science, art as expression, not as market campaign. You know, that's that line right there is kind of what art being the music, right? In this case is kind of what this song is about um, as a whole. And, um, you know, I think I think Rush kind of battled with that concept up until 2112 when they had their breakthrough, right? And then they kind of were just, you know, a big F you to any record company. And, you know, record company says do X and Rush does Y, right? Um, and I think that mindset is tied into radio here, hence the themes of the song. So I'm going to, I'm not going to read every lyric, but I'm going to uh, pick on a few of them. Uh, the, the first part here, begin the day with a friendly voice, a companion unobtrusive, you know, playing that song that's so elusive and the magic mu music makes your morning mood. To me, that is the DJ that you're listening to when you turn on your radio first thing in the morning, right? Um, now, I think that verse and the next two verses, off on your way, hit the open road to um, invisible airways, crack with life, you know, down to uh, emotional feedback on a timeless wavelength, bearing a gift beyond price, almost free. I feel that these um, three, these first three verses kind of set up um, what it's like being the listener of radio, uh, of music and of radio. Um, whereas the next two verses seem to be more from the musician's point of view, um, which are all this machinery making modern music can still be open hearted. You know, it's really just a question of your honesty. Yeah, your honesty. Jack, Jack Black. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you know one likes to believe in the freedom of music but glittering prizes and endless compromises shatter the illusion of integrity yeah, yeah. um so um like all right so remember how i uh, well actually i'll get to this in a second but um i i feel like this part you know musicians who don't make it big quick tend to take shortcuts tend to sacrifice, you know, I, the freedom of music or, or sacrifice their ideas of how they want their career to go to kind of pander to the record company or what people want to hear. Right. They, they make those sacrifices. Um, and they kind of, you're kind of throwing away your integrity in, in a way, right. To get famous and get rich and rush absolutely did not do this. And I think this is kind of their way of pos positively stating that. It's kind of their way of, you know, stating that through words and, and lyrics. Um, it's not really them taking a shot at the record company, which I think they've subtly done and not so subtle, subtly done in the past, you know, in lyrics. Uh, this is kind of a positive, you know, an upbeat, positive song. Uh, with the very exception of the last verse, which is the, you know, I think it's kind of the one negative part of, of this. And that is for the words of the prophets are written on the studio wall, concert hall echoes with the sounds of salesmen. So uh, Neil says in Merely Players, this is where a sense of humor comes into it. I was sitting there thinking of the conclusion of the song. Uh, and the parody came into my mind and I thought, well, either this is very stupid or it's very great. But all it says is salesmen as artists, I can see as an ideal, but they have no place in telling us what to play on stage. And they have no place any more than a car salesman in the recording studio. Um, so like I was saying earlier, the Kiss reference. All right. The salesman being echoed in the concert hall to me. Um, could also be referred to or could also be drawing parallels to some bands that Rush, uh, you know, played with and toured with prior to this album. Um, Kiss, they put their name, they put their likeness on literally everything as seen behind Tim with his Kiss action figures right above his head. <laughs> that's, not, that's not even all of them. And I'm not even that crazy a collector. That's just some of the stuff I happen to have. But yeah, yeah, there came there came a time, especially in the '90s, when the original four got back together, where it just got ridiculous. So they really will put that logo 
on yeah. everything. I think the coffin probably takes the cake, right? The, yeah, the kiss coffin. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and at, at a certain point, it's like, and 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 from personal experience, when people know that I like Kiss, it's bad, because oh, Tim will love this. No, Tim won't. I'm one of those. I, I, weird, mean, I actually like their music. I like some of the the memorabilia, but sure. I, I I'm <laughs> not I'm not trying to shine a negative light on Kiss. Okay, no, I I, I, I love Kiss. I mean, I own a bunch of Kiss records, and I I really like Kiss. I'm just saying it's it's a very different. Now, to Donna's point, you know, they mentored them and all that, and I'm sure they were extremely grateful, and we as fans are extremely grateful and all that. At least it sh- at least Kiss showed Rush how to be a hardworking band, and clearly they kind of took that and ran with it. Yeah. It's just very vastly different in that Kiss will throw their names and their likeness on everything. Rush and, and Getty – in particular, I, I'm aware that you know everything needs to be perfect, and every, it, they never want to take advantage of their fans. Um, you know, I, I was told with the moving pictures 40th anniversary that just came out. You know, every little thing, I believe, goes through Getty that he needs to approve, and he doesn't want it to be like we're just trying to snatch money from our fans. They want it perfectly, and I think this song, while written in you know 1979, 1980 different mindset then it still applies to where the band was when they were you know still touring and still putting out records um integrity and not only integrity just treating people with respect right um we're, uh, not to i guess be political but we're in pride month just you don't have to agree with it you don't have to back it just don't be an asshole period that's it be respectful like just in general right um, and I think there's, it's just integrity and honesty. And, and that's what this, this song, um, shines light on, you know, and the last thing I want to mention the guitar solo. Okay. I, I, I can't do a rush deep dive without mentioning an Alex star solo. Right. Um, you not an, it's a fantastic solo. It's not overly long. It's only about 20 seconds long. Um, timed it today. Um, you know, but a lot like the opening riff, it's one that Alex plays kind of fast, you know, kind of melodic. Um, you know, it's, he doesn't really make it sound like he's just wanking on that, on that whammy bar. It's just subtle enough to where it takes that solo from here to the next level. Uh, and it's, it's an iconic solo, right? Um, and it's one still, I mean, same with the opening riff. I, I don't know how he does it live. Um, all the time but it's it's fantastic. and i love how it goes into that 50s rock and roll piano at the end and yeah i get three things to say about this song and i'll make it quick thing number one the begin the day with a friendly voice has been pretty well documented that's autobiographical getty had a favorite dj when he yes. was growing up And he grew up in a home where radio was a big deal. So did I. And if you've grown up around radio, you hate to see what it's become. Okay. And that gets me to thing two, the words of the prophets. That, of course, is a pun on Simon and Garfunkel, Sounds of Silence. The words of the prophets are written on the subway wall, which comes from the Bible. Uh, book Daniel, I believe, um, and the prophets being the prophets like in Amos and Ezekiel and all of those folks, whereas prophets as in making a buck. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that gets me to part three. And this is very hard for me to say, and I haven't said it. I mean, I sort of said it, but there was what was going on at that point has to do with what the band noticed about what was happening to radio. People ask me all the time, could you discover Rush today? And the answer is, I could not. Not because I don't want to, I hear great music all the time. But Rush were watching as the industry changed as freeform radio, the kind of radio that enabled me to take an unknown Canadian band, put a song on that I thought was a really good song, and then put another one on just because I could, that was going away. 
It was being replaced by formats. It was being replaced by 40 song playlists. Now top 40 had always had that, but album rock did not. Album rock was the FM thing where, you know, the DJs played what they wanted. Well, in reality, no, they really didn't. The music director helped to pick what the DJ played or the program director. But my point is, it was a lot more loose in terms of the number of songs you could play. And Rush were watching by the end of the 70s as tight formats took over in album rock, where it was like, you know, Here's the songs you can play. Do you ever feel like if you hear Limelight one more time, you will scream? Because that's what happened. It used to be that you could play five or six or seven tracks from an album, pick a deep cut. But then along came a format called Rock and Stereo, where it was like, these are the one or two songs you can play. That's it. And they watched it all and they were like, you, we don't like what's happening. And I mean, yes, we're still a radio band, but we're even seeing this happening with our music where stations that used to play five or six of our songs are now two. Yeah. Okay. So it just became all about ratings and all about profits. And hey, I like to make a profit just like anybody else, but not at the expense of some great music. There are people who will never hear some of the best Rush songs because stations stop playing them. I right. find that profoundly disappointing. Uh, Donna, the, the station you're referencing is um, popular Toronto radio station CFNY, now known as Edge. Yep. Um, and Alex was quoted in a 1996 guitar player interview saying, Radio has become a lot more commercialized since then. Now the station that we wrote that song about won't even play our music. That's that exactly was a, my point. That was in 1996. No, but that's exactly yeah. my point. And that was the right. era <laughs> when Auntie Donna and 20,000 of her closest friends all lost their jobs because media consolidation happened. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 sure. happened. And... Stations suddenly started doing voice tracking, automating this, that, and that whole live and local, you hear it in every city. Auntie Donna reinvented herself, went back to school and got her PhD, but I'd be lying to you if I said I don't miss radio. And when Rush wrote this song, it was almost kind of like a premonition of what was going to happen. Yeah, even, even on... Serious XM radio, right? I mean, it's like I have to beg Christine Stone to play the analog kid, you know? It, it's <laughs> it's like I mean, I, I, I subscribe to Sirius XM and we'll we'll wrap here in a moment, but um Ozzy's Boneyard and like classic rewind and these these channels that used to play Rush, you could hear Rush all the time. I feel personally that over the last couple of years the Rush is going away for whatever reason and i don't know why i don't i don't know maybe because they're not touring anymore where some of these other bands are yeah. so they're just not as not as in maybe i don't know but um it's sad yeah. because there's so many deep cuts that and- well the younger djs also don't know the band i mean i was at an ice cream place the other day and i was like you know just talking music and i'm like who do you like and the kid starts naming me a bunch of bands no problem i keep up with everything come on um and he says well who do you like and i said well i'm kind of known for this rock band called rush and this is like a 20 year old and he's like who are rush that's why i feel like it's up to you know it's up to people like us to uh educate however we can you know i'm very proud i've got you know, the I, next generation I've, in. you know my kids are, are are 18 and and uh 20 and they both like rush yes which blew my like and i really didn't try that hard they just found them on their own and then next thing you know i see cds missing from my shelf and it was you know one of those proud dad moments. proud dad moments. Yeah. yeah there you go <laughs> hey i was, I was in a I supermarket somebody walked up to me and said i saw you on deep dive i'm like well thank you and the kid wait 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 wait. wait. that happened that 
as God is my witness. I, <laughs> no I tweeted about it. I tweeted about it about four days ago. That's um, crazy. I was in a grocery store. Yeah. And uh, the kid that he, his kid was like, yeah, rush, you know, he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, you're a good dad. Okay. then." Yeah. But that's, that's the line in there about one likes to believe in the freedom of music. Yeah. Okay. But will we live in a world where there is the freedom of music? And the freedom of music doesn't just mean what somebody did 15 minutes ago. It means also having respect for classic rock and for the great bands that still sound as good today as they ever did. Next. Yeah, well, now the freedom of music is quite literally my freedom to just go on here and pick what I want, right? Yeah. Which again is sad because as a yeah, I mean, radio DJ for four, you know, four decades, um, it's kind of like I don't recognize my industry anymore. Yeah. The um, the positive thing, if we if we want to, you know, Dan, this on a positive note, I love the fact that this song does talk about, you know, in the second the industry and the compromises that some people fall prey to, and they did it all in a song which became. And in some parts of the world, their first big hit. I think this oh, went to number 13 yeah. in the yeah. UK. Uh, I think it was 51 in the States, which is respectable. You know, it's knocking on the door of the top 40. And I, I think it was somewhere in the 20s in, in Canada. And, and they managed to be uh, melodic and concise. You know, it was about five minutes long. And still say what they wanted to say in the lyrics. And it's a great song to listen to in your car. It's got a yep. good beat. It's easy to dance to, you know. Just... It, for me, it's one of those bulletproof songs. There, there will never come a point where Spirit of Radio comes on and I change the station. Indeed. It's not going to happen. That cartoon thing was so bizarre. I've never been in a cartoon <laughs> before. I mean, I've been called a cartoon before, but I've never been in one. Uh, so, just a, a last comment on that, you know, beginning the day with a friendly voice that friendly voice is getty too in a way oh, because yes. it's yes. It, you know to the point where he even wore a little name tag on tour that said friendly one time uh yeah. it, it's quite quite and I, uh, I don't know terrible. about you but actually i probably do know about you so i'll just say this to the people that are watching us hi people um did you ever be having a really kind of miserable day and you turn on your radio and you hear a rush song and you're just yeah it's like hearing from better, friends and you feel better because we're all part of a community sure and sure. yeah begin the day with a friendly voice can we can we uh end this episode with some getty chicken hand dance please from everyone oh, like in the spirit of radio yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll see you next time on rush deep dive when we talk about uh hemispheres that should be a fun one and if there's anything we missed leave it in the comments please, please. we read your comments faithfully so if you've got a different interpretation from ours or if you're sitting there like wanting to throw things at your monitor going oh my god why didn't they talk about that say so please say it we will comment back yeah 100 percent Awesome. Donna, Matt, Tim, Ryan, myself. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody.